Okay, this week we're going to talk more about concrete, but we're going to talk about reinforced concrete this week. So hopefully I can get through this. I've got a wicked cold I'm blaming on you guys. Um, concrete is a mixture of three things. Uh, Portland cement, aggregate, fine aggregate, actually coarse and fine aggregate can be combined, and uh, water. Now, concrete doesn't uh, just harden, it cures by creating heat and a chemical reaction between the Portland cement, the aggregate, and the water, uh, creates a heat uh, called heat of hydration, and that uh, uh, hardens the concrete to particular proportions. Concrete in itself is extremely strong in compression. In other words, you can squeeze it and it's not going to budge. However, it doesn't stretch very well, so its tensile strength is less. Um, at the end of this portion of my lecture, I've, I've grabbed a couple of videos and I'm going to tag on to the end of this on reinforcing steel and uh, um, some other aspects of just uh, how uh, Portland cement is created uh, itself as, as one of the groups. In addition to the three major components to concrete, we have additives that are available in um, concrete. One of those additives that we use a lot up here in the Northeast is air entrainment. Uh, it is a chemical that's put into the concrete that creates small microscopic uh, air bubbles in the concrete, which allows it to um, better react to cold, uh, freezing and thawing. It gives it a little bit more expansion and contraction on the inside. Um, I was on a job once, didn't know what they were talking about when they said they were waiting for some air for the concrete because it didn't have enough in it, and I thought they were looking for a compressor somewhere, but in essence it is a chemical that is added to the concrete, and you'll see it a lot up in this area again. <coughs> we talk about embodied energy. Um, people have uh, tested different materials, wood, concrete, to find out what the embodied energy, how many BTUs, British Thermal Units, are required to create a certain material. In concrete's uh, <coughs> uh, the case, the average strength concrete, the embodied energy ranges from 200 to 300 BTUs per pound of concrete. Now, a BTU is a British Thermal Unit. Uh, it's technical um, uh, um, definition is the amount of heat required to raise one pound of water one degree. Uh, I had an old uh, shop teacher that referred to it as the amount of heat produced by one wooden kitchen match if you burn it to its entirety. So in the manufacturing of the Portland cement there's certainly uh, heat that's used in the kilns and whatnot to uh, to, to cook this material down, make this powder, uh, there's, there is quite a bit of energy if you think of it in a per pound uh, measure. Um, wood can be looked at the same way when we talk about wood later on. We look at the amount of energy is required to cut down the tree, haul it to the mill, um, cut it into its dimensional size, uh, plane it, put it in a dry kiln, ship it to the, to the market, uh, take it to the job site, put it in place. Uh, there's, if you stop and think about all of those things, there's quite a bit of embodied energy involved in these products. Other things that can be added to the concrete uh, are lightweight aggregates. Uh, some of this is expanded shale that uh, is just kind of a lightweight material, helps hold the, the concrete together and gives it about 20% less weight than normal concrete. Uh, sometimes required when you need to get it into specific areas, uh, you may have lightweight concrete aggregates involved. Here we see some strength comparison charts. <coughs> this is pounds per square inch of concrete. This is the difference between air entrained concrete and normal concrete based on the ratio water to cement ratio. Um, the higher the cement ratio of the water content in the cement, the lower the strength. Uh, also, the easier it is to pour. The less water, 
the more strength you get from the concrete, but it is more difficult to place than because you get a lot more um, uh, stiffer material involved in this. So if you're looking for 3,000 pound uh, PSI concrete after 28 days, you're going to be looking at about a 0.6, just under 0.6 ratio of water to cement. At the job site, as the concrete is being poured, we do a slump test, which is basically taking this uh, inverted uh, cone and we fill it with concrete. <coughs> Actually, it's filled in this position and tap down with a stick to get all the air bubbles out of it. The cone is pulled off the top and then they measure the distance from the top of the cone to where the concrete slumps. Uh, most concrete specifications will call for a specific slump in inches from the cone. So it might say a maximum two and a half inch slump or a maximum four inch slump depending on the consistency. If it doesn't meet that requirement, sometimes the concrete will be sent back. But usually at the job site when the truck comes in, there's a technician standing there uh, doing this test on site. Um, and then they're taking also samples to be uh, tested for uh, PSI um, uh, strength. The handling and placing of concrete, uh, we talked about slurry walls. Uh, one of the big issues with concrete is making sure that the concrete and the, ag or the, the cement and the mixture and the stone doesn't segregate. Uh, uh, segregation is when all of the stones or the aggregate fall to the bottom or don't get mixed up thoroughly and you end up with a lot of aggregate in one spot and a lot of cement in another which can cause some dry spots places where when you pull the formwork off all of a sudden you uh, you find some just aggregate exposed with air pockets so it's important that the placement of this material be mixed thoroughly at all times so that it stays consistent throughout the pour. Anything over three to five feet or so, uh, they have to make sure that the concrete can fall freely without obstruction so that segregation will not incur. And in this case, it might be deposited through drop shoots, which are basically just uh, baffled shoots that'll, that kind of break the fall of the concrete as it's going down into the uh, location. Then the concrete must be consolidated in the forms to eliminate trapped air. They do this with a vibrating tool or just poking a stick or rod down into the immersion to just release any air bubbles that might be down inside there that would cause issues later on. <coughs> the formwork, a lot of times it's wood, plywood. It's braced. It could be metal. could be plastic. We want to create this negative shape of the form. Uh, to pour the concrete into so it needs to be uh, thoroughly braced and reinforced so that the weight of the concrete doesn't uh, allow it to uh, deform itself and also the forms have a form release compound on them which is can be an oil or wax or plastic to prevent adhesion of the concrete to the form so when you remove the form you end up with a smooth surface and the concrete doesn't stick to it. Here are some supplementary cementitious materials that can be added to concrete mixtures for particular uses. <coughs> the first group are pozolins, materials that react with calcium hydroxide in wet concrete to form cementing compounds. Uh, the first one is fly ash, which is a powder uh, waste product from coal-fired power plants that's used to um, increase the, the concrete strength, decrease permeability, increase sulfate resistance with, or um, salt resistance, uh, reduces temperature rise during curing, produces, reduces mixing water, and improves pumpability and workability of concrete. Uh, and it also reduces the concrete shrinkage. Another material that can be added is silica fume, also known as microsilica. It's a powder that's approximately 100 times finer than Portland cement, consisting mostly of silicon dioxide. And it, again, is a waste product or a byproduct of the electronic semiconductor chip manufacturing. And when it added to the concrete, it does produce an extremely high strength concrete that with a low permeability. In other words, it won't allow moisture to get into it. Silica fume. Uh, oh, we just went through that one. Natural pozolons, mostly derived from shales or clay, are used for purposes such as reducing the internal temperature of the concrete. Um, 
and I'll, I'll post this so you guys can download this if you, if you like anyway it's just material I took out of uh, one of my textbooks blast furnace slag also called slag cement is a byproduct of the iron manufacturing it's a hydraulic cement meaning that like Portland cement it reacts directly with water to form a cementitious compound may be added to concrete mixes to improve workability Increased strength, reduce permeability, reduce temperature rise during curing, and improve sulfate resistance. Um, anytime we add this type of material, it's called the blended cement uh, into the into the mix. Oops, did I just go backwards? Add mixtures. Add mixtures or ingredients other than cement and other cementitious material aggregates and water broadly referred to as admixtures are often added to concrete to alter its properties in various ways. The first one is the air and training admixture I mentioned earlier. That it increases the workability of the concrete, reduces freeze thaw damage, and we used in larger amounts creates very lightweight non-structural concretes with thermal insulating properties. Water reducing admixtures, just mixtures that uh, allow you to use less water and still have the same workability. High range water reducing admixtures, also known as super plasticizers, organic compounds that transform a stiff concrete mix into one that flows freely into the forms. We have accelerating admixtures, cause concrete to cure more rapidly. And then we have retarding admixtures, which can slow down the curing process if you need more time to work with the concrete in its wet uh, in its wet form. We have workability agents, improve the plasticity of wet cement. We have shrinkage reducing admixtures. We have corrosion inhibitors. We want to be make sure that any steel inside is uh, that has you know might be exposed to any moisture uh, doesn't get any uh, corrosion because that will just ruin or the concrete will just kind of flow apart. We see that a lot in bridges and bridge abutments. Freeze protection admixtures allow concrete to cure satisfactorily at temperatures as low as 20 degrees Fahrenheit. It's important that when we're curing concrete that it stays above freezing unless you use some type of freeze protection admixture. Most times we will just cover it with a blanket or hay bales. <coughs> Extended set control admixtures may be used to delay the curing reaction in concrete for any period up to several days. Um, and then once you're ready, you put an activator in it, which will actually cure the concrete. So something you might see out there. Um, I mentioned coloring agents, just uh, that they are available if you want to put some color or control the color of the concrete for building components whose appearance is important. Now we're going to look at steel reinforcing, and again, I've got a little film we'll throw on the end of this, but steel reinforcing bars, normally called just rebar, um, have a deformed surface. It's not just a smooth piece of steel, this deformity allows the concrete material uh, to adhere to the steel, and it comes in sizes, American sizes, in eighth inch increments. Uh, a number four rebar would be four eighths of an inch in diameter or one half inch. A number five rebar, five eighths of an inch. A number six rebar would be six eighths or three quarters of an inch. So it's easy to, if somebody says number four, you automatically think half inch size rebar. It's pretty easy just to total up those eighth inches. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's our chart. The American bar size for rebar and the metric size, number three rebar is 0.375 inches. It weighs 0.376 pounds per linear foot. Uh, so you can figure that out. There's the half inch number four. One inch bar would be a number eight, eight bar and, uh, and so on. So all the way up to a number 18. I'm sure there's larger ones that are not in here, but uh, these are all... Um, designations for the size and weight of the uh, rebar based on ASTM standards. Rebar itself has certain codes stamped into it. The ribs mean certain things. The deformations have certain things which indicate um, this one for instance has the two ribs, a grade mark of minimum yield strength that's a grade 60. A grade 40 or 50 would be listed with this type of rib. The letter is the designation of the producing steel mill. The number here is the size of the rebar. 
and the N indicates indicates the uh, type of steel. Uh, and uh, there are charts in the books that would be able to tell you what these mean, but the the architectural specifications or the structural specifications would indicate what type of rebar is required, and it's important that the contractor supply exactly the rebar that is being looked for or get approval prior to. Also important in reinforcing steel is the bending radiuses. The bending radius, for instance, of a number four rebar for a 180 degree hook, this would be a 180 degree hook, is <coughs> excuse me, three times the diameter. So if D is um, one half inch, then your and your your J dimension would be four inches all the way around, and we need to to bend this. So these dimensions are specific. So if we're doing hooks or stirrups, they need to bend at specific radiuses to maintain the strength of the uh, structure. So, and they're all based on the size of the rebar itself. D is the finished bend diameter. In this case it's a three inch bend diameter for a number four rebar. The uh, You can see this one for a 90 degree bend would be eight inches. So this distance here would be eight inches. This one would be uh, three inches for the half inch. Rebar connectors, a lot of times you'll see on the job site that rebars are connected by just lapping them one to the other and wrapping it with wire. There is a specific lap distance that's required based on the diameter of the rebar. It's uh, so many like 40 or 50 uh, times the diameter of the rebar. So if it's a half inch diameter, uh, you might have to lap it 20 inches uh, to uh, properly maintain the strength. In addition, there are also these high-tech coupling devices that allow us to uh, couple rebar together end-to-end -to, -end to save space. Sometimes we're putting so much rebar in columns and columns and other types of structural members that we don't have room for the aggregate to pass, so we actually will put these connectors on. And sometimes these connectors, as you'll see in a little French video I've, I've found online, they'll put the deformation on the connectors themselves to help the concrete maintain its uh, structural integrity. <coughs> Excuse me. Horizontally laid rebar has to be supported by chairs made of wire, or they could be a piece of brick. Um, sometimes they're plastic. Uh, these are wire chairs or bolsters. Um, the bolster will lift the rebar off the ground so it doesn't just lay in the bottom. Um, and uh, you'll notice some of these have plastic caps on them, so that would be a portion of the rebar that would be exposed to the outside so it prevents any water from getting into the steel and allowing it to corrode later on. So if there's a water issue, you'll probably see these plastic caps on the, uh, on the supporting chairs and, and bolsters. So there's a number of different types that you can purchase. Reinforcing a simple concrete beam, and I think this is fairly important that the ideal simple, simply supported beam under uniform loading, compressive or squeezing forces follow a set of arch-like curves that create a maximum compressive strength in the top of the beam. In other words, if it's setting on two points, it's going to want to sag or compress at the top. On the bottom of that same beam, there's going to be a set of curves corresponding to paths of tensile strength. In other words, it's going to want to stretch itself at the bottom with stresses reaching a maximum at the middle of the span. In an ideally reinforced concrete beam, steel reinforcing bars would be bent to follow these lines of tension and the bunching of the bars at mid-span would serve to resist the higher stresses at that point. Uh, and because concrete is very strong in compression and less strong in uh, tension, or tensile strength, most of the bars are going to be arranged at the bottom of the beam. So you can see by this diagram, we see this beam setting on two um, fulcrums, 
and we have most of our reinforcing in the bottom we have these stirrups and just some smaller rebar in the top so we have these concrete um, um, or excuse me the rebar is in the bottom evenly spaced there's plenty of cover around the bottom so as this thing is forced down this reinforcing will pick up on the um, the strains and prevent it from cracking in addition to plastic and drying shrinkage concrete is also subject to a term called creep where over a period of time the concrete may shrink and gradually become uh, uh, less and less and will actually creep so the design is it must be um, created that will um, allow for that creep and make sure that it doesn't uh, push something out of place so um, this is all you know stuff that's that's available now to too far whoops there we go and go ahead sorry about that pre-stressing you can see what happens if a concrete beam is setting and the steel is just laid in here and poured these forces may eventually crack the bottom of the concrete even though it'll stretch a little bit with the steel in there uh, we'll get some tensile cracking and uh, the concrete will start to deform and, and crack to eliminate that we have something called pre-stressing so if we're able imagine if you will taking a piece of uh, rectangular shaped piece of styrofoam drilling a hole lengthwise through that piece of styrofoam might be a foot long taking a rubber band and threading that through that hole and then putting that rubber band under tension in other words stretch it out tie a knot in both ends or put a pin in it and let it go the tendency for that if it's in kind of the bottom of the piece of styrofoam the tendency of that would be for it to camber a little bit in other words give it a little bit of a um, arch so we can do the same thing with steel soft steel will stretch and there's two ways to do pre-stressing in concrete here we see a concrete beam that has the reinforcing steel stretched so that when it cures the, when the concrete cures it actually will have this camber this is that arch and then under load it will actually flatten itself out so putting this type of tension in the steel is referred to as pre-stressing and there are two ways to do that there is pre-tensioning and post-tensioning so with pre-tensioning um, this might be something for precast concrete members floor beams or girders where the steel strands are actually stretched in a form uh, off-site they could be done on-site but usually it's an off-site situation the steel is stretched to a specific um, tension the concrete is poured it's allowed to cure and then the tension is released off that steel with the ends um, uh, bound on the piece so it actually creates that camber that tension and pulls it up and then the material would be taken to the job site and that's why sometimes when you see some of these precast concrete uh, structural floor slabs or beams going down the road they actually have that little curve to them it might be an inch to a half inch but it's enough of a curve that you can tell it's under uh, some pretensioning now post tensioning is usually done on the job site on the building site and in this case the uh, the tendons are actually strung throughout the floor slab or the beam inside a plastic um, tube now, the steel strands are called tendons and are covered with a steel or plastic tube and they are actually um, allowed to pour the concrete on the site and then they put the uh, reinforcing steel into it so oops there's one there so here's the first step we're going to stretch the steel this is in pre-tensioning we're going to stretch the steel and lock it pour the concrete and then release the steel locking the ends in place to get this camber under the post tensioning we drape this tendon that's encased in a plastic so it actually will allow it to slide back and forth and the concrete doesn't necessarily um, attach to it other than the plastic or the steel 
And then afterwards, there's a hydraulic jack brought, brought in. It's, it pulls on these tendons and um, creates the camber on, on the job site. Here is a uh, structural post-tensioning uh, beam. They put this large hydraulic jack. These are your tendons laid out in here. Uh, they they uh, put them to a certain pressure and then lock them in place to provide the proper strength. <coughs> in this case, they're doing the same thing to a uh, post-tensioning a structural floor where they're using a smaller hydraulic jack to pull on these tendons and you'll notice these little lock bars once they've got it to the right uh, tension they'll slide these in and hammer them in place then the tension actually these are the the cables you can see the the tube on this side the the, the uh, strands and then this device this pulls it to tension and then, then they have these two wedges that fit around the pipe and get hammered in and that's what locks that uh, tension on the cable in place so all of these are tensioned all the way down, locked in place, and that's what gives the floor its strength uh, and, and prevents it from, from cracking. So the next part, I'm going to show you some, uh, some videos that I took off the internet that, that kind of expand on this idea of pre-tension, post-tension, reinforcing steel, and some other items with reinforced structural concrete. <coughs> we find it in columns, footings, beams, floor slabs, wall construction uh, in concrete. You're going to find this all over in bridge abutments and piers. Um, this type of construction is pretty basic, but it's used all over the, the world, and it's something that, especially as civil engineers, you're going to need to be very familiar with. Cement and concrete. Cement is a fine gray powder that's used to make concrete. It's also an ingredient in the mortar that masons use to lay brick and stone. Cement also goes into soil cement, a material that's used in paving roads, building dams, and lining reservoirs. The action begins at the limestone quarry. The limestone near the surface has a high content of the minerals silica, iron, and aluminum oxide. Deeper down, the limestone is more pure, containing less of those minerals and more calcium carbonate. The plant uses both types of rock, altering the proportions to make different <coughs> Workers drill holes in the rock wall, in which they plant powerful explosives. For safety, the workers have to position themselves behind the area they're blasting, maintaining a distance of at least 50 meters. After the explosion, loaders move in. They transfer the limestone rocks to 50-ton capacity dump trucks. The trucks then haul their cargo to the cement plant nearby. plant, the trucks dump the rocks into what's called the primary crusher. The rocks can be as big as a piano. The primary crusher reduces them to about the size of softballs. There's a constant spray of water to keep the dust from billowing up and settling on the shoots. From there, a conveyor transports the rocks to the secondary crusher. It reduces them further to about the size of golf balls. Rock high in calcium carbonate and rock low in calcium carbonate are crushed separately. Now it's time to mix the two. The ratio varies according to the type of cement they're making. This overhead machine called a tripper makes piles of the required proportions. They call this the raw mix. Then, a reclaimer loads the raw mix into a grinding machine called a roller mill. Depending on what minerals are already naturally in the crushed rock, the factory adds extra minerals, such as silica and iron. Certain types of cement also require aluminum oxide. The roller mixes and grinds the ingredients uniformly, producing a dry rock powder called the raw meal. Now the powder goes into a preheater, 
the temperature of the powder is 80 degrees Celsius upon entering. Within 40 seconds, it gets more than 10 times hotter. This begins the process of bonding the minerals together so that they'll later harden when hydrated with water. The preheater is equipped with what's called a flash calciner. In about 5 seconds, it removes 95% of the carbon dioxide and the powder through a chemical reaction. This isolates the lime, which is the most important element in cement. From there, the powder moves into a rotary kiln, a huge cylindrical furnace. It's set at an angle so that the powder moves from top to bottom a distance of 49 meters. The kiln rotates about two turns a minute to ensure the material travels through at the right speed. The burner's gas flame at the bottom reaches a scorching 16 to 1700 degrees Celsius. As the powder approaching it reaches the 1500 degree mark, it fuses into pieces about the size of marbles. These pieces are called clinker. As the clinker leaves the kiln, large fans cool it down to between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. It's important to cool the clinker quickly in order to have quality cement. From here, the clinker goes to the storage area. The last stage of cement making is called finish grinding. They add some gypsum to the clinker, the precise amount varies with the type of cement they're making. Gypsum delays the cement setting time so that it can be worked for up to two hours before hardening. The cement mills are called ball mills because they contain metal balls, about 150 tons of them in the largest mill. As the mill rotates, the balls crush and grind the clinker and gypsum into a fine powder. The Erison Coupler in construction, we also speak of a sleeve, or more simply, a rebar connector. But I know that when you're not in the trade, the object may appear insignificant. However, to get where it is today, it's been on a long journey, abundant with discoveries, technical progress, and a little luck along the way. With a little audacity, we could even say it all started with the Romans. In the shade of the Colosseum, our distant Latin cousins concocted a surprising blend by mixing limestone, clay, volcanic sand from Puzol, and water to produce mortar, the ancestor to concrete. Well, it's true, the recipe got a little lost in the ramblings of history. It resurfaced a few centuries later, directly in the head of a certain John Smeaton, a British engineer. Other engineers were then involved in improving this recipe, and today, to make concrete, well, firstly, you need limestone, clay, and a pinch of gypsum. What you produce from this mixture is cement, which is then mixed with water, sand, and gravel to make concrete. But let us return to the Age of Enlightenment, because during this period another recipe was being prepared in the blast furnaces, the recipe for steel, a subtle alloy that with a few extra grams of carbon would make iron prehistoric, and with a few grams less would relegate cast iron to the weight room. OK, I'm exaggerating just a little, but the right dose of carbon enables steel to be much more resistant than iron, and much less brittle than cast iron, which makes it perfect for many applications, especially in the construction trade. So you see, concrete and steel begin to meet on the work site at the end of the 18th century. At this time, they're only just meeting, because in all honesty, they ignore each other very successfully for several decades. And yet, concrete and steel have everything they need to get on well. Concrete is not so expensive and resistant to compression, but a lot less resistant to tension. Steel is very resistant to compression and tension, but costs an arm and a leg. I think you understand. By casting concrete onto a small quantity of steel, well, we can obtain a material that's resistant to compression and a tension and a material which is cost-effective. We're now at the end of the 19th century, and reinforced steel has just been invented. For architects and engineers, this new composite material is a godsend. We're now able to build even higher and even bigger, so we need to find even longer bars, and that's where the snag is. But that doesn't hold us back. We just need to put the two bars together end to end. And in order not to lose resistance, we just need to overlap the two bars. This is called lapping. 
It's essential here that lapping ensures the same resistance as if the bar were in one continuous piece. This means the length of lapping must be about 50 times longer than the diameter of the bars. In fact, 30 to 60 times more to be more precise. It all depends on the resistance of the concrete cast around the bars. In other words, if the diameter of the bars is 4 centimeters, then lapping will be about 2 meters. All this could happily have continued in the world of concrete and steel if it hadn't been for a slight problem of bonding. I say slight, however. Concrete, as we said, doesn't resist well to tension. In a beam such as this one, the load is transferred from the concrete to the rebars in areas under stress. In other words, areas subject to tensile load. Once again, the two materials must bond perfectly, one to the other. At the beginning of the 20th century, well, at this time the rebars used, as you can see, were perfectly smooth and the concrete was unable to bond to this smooth surface without a raised pattern. If the steel doesn't take up this stress, the concrete, which is unable to do it, will begin to crack and the whole beam may collapse. To resolve this problem, bonding bars were produced with profile patterns. In other words, with this raised pattern, the new bars perpetuated the tradition of lapping. The technique is proven and is still used today in many work sites. All these bars sticking out of walls are waiting for lapping. Once again, developments could have stopped here. However, on work sites, in the shade of a few impassive cranes where concrete mixers relentlessly mix their rubble and sand, under the benevolent eye of a few placid tractor loaders, vaguely perturbed by the soft rumbling of the stuttering pneumatic drills, someone was heard to say that it wasn't enough that the technique could be still further improved. In fact, to build a wall, concrete is cast into formwork like this over steel rebars. Once the concrete is set, the framework is removed. However, to introduce the rebars required for lapping, holes must be drilled in the formwork, which cannot be reused subsequently. Not very practical, and masons all agree that it's a long and complicated process to implement, especially during construction of big structures. To resolve this issue, a connector was developed, a connector that is used to connect two bars placed end to end. There are several types of connectors, like this one, or this one, or the Erisong coupler. The advantage is that with such a device, from now on, once formwork is removed, all you need to do is screw on a bar and continue to work on site. It's much faster, formwork doesn't need to be drilled, and this rebar coupler saves meters and meters of lapping steel. In short, the coupler is a godsend, and you may well ask yourself why it wasn't thought of earlier. All said and done, it's true that the tool is not child's play. To ensure the same resistance as lapping, this part must be robust. In fact, a connector must be more solid than the bars themselves. And before it arrives on a work site, well, each new model is subjected to a whole set of merciless tests. A real ordeal. Here, the two bars and the connector that connects them are put under tension. A force of 600 tons is exercised at each end, a lot more than would occur in reality. To pass this test, the bars must break before the connector. And it's not finished there. Even if it's used in regions that are calm, well, our tenacious little connector must also be able to withstand the violence of an earthquake. It's compressed and stretched at the same time, over and over again. Resistance to fatigue is also tested by a pulling action two million times in succession. You can see that it's only after a very long ordeal that a connector achieves the right to be cast in concrete. To ensure utmost safety standards, not the slightest weakness is tolerated. Until today, all connectors used were smooth, just like the bars in the past. After all, we could say that connectors only represent a few centimeters and that they don't play a great role with respect to the bonding of concrete and steel. But today, buildings are more and more complex. They need to be more solid. Many smooth connectors can be found side by side in structures interwoven with rebars. This creates an area of weakness. For certain buildings, e.g. nuclear power plants, this cannot be envisaged. The building requires a real coat of chainmail. That's why a new connector has been developed. 
a connector that we now call a coupler, the famous Erison coupler. Using this technique, the bonding bars are upset. That means they're compressed at one end to increase the diameter. The density of the material increases, making the metal more resistant in this area. They are then threaded to be able to screw into the coupler. Two rings, known as lock nuts, are then used to lock the bars on each side of this new rebar coupling device. The coupler is not only smaller and lighter, it's also more resistant than the other connectors. It has improved bonding qualities, especially with its raised pattern, from which it takes the name Erison, meaning hedgehog. As a result, concrete and steel have never been so intimately coupled. All you really need to do is think about it. Moreover, I asked myself why the Romans didn't think about it earlier. Must have slipped their minds. Uh, yeah. oh. The ASTM specifications require that reinforcing bars be identified by a distinguishing set of marks legibly rolled onto the surface of one side of the bar. The marks indicate, in order, the producing mill, bar size, type of steel, and minimum yield designation. The producing mill is shown by letter or symbol, and a company may have different symbols for each mill location. The bar size is shown by an Arabic number corresponding to metric bar sizes number 10 through number 36, number 43, and number 57, or inch pound markings number 3 through number 11, number 14, and number 18. The type of steel is shown by letters and symbols below the bar size. The letter S identifies requirements meeting ASTM A615. The letter W identifies steel meeting the ASTM A706 specification. Other types of steel are covered by different letters and symbols. The minimum yield designation is shown by either a number or a line. Grade 60-420 megapascals rebar has either the number 4 or a single additional line through at least five deformation spaces adjacent to the continuous longitudinal rib. Grade 75, 520 megapascals has the number five or two additional longitudinal lines. No grade number or additional line is required for grade 40, 300 megapascals. A706 does not require either a grade number or an additional line space. It's specified only in grade 60. The ASTM specifications also have requirements for deformations rolled onto the surface of bars. Producing mills have different deformation patterns, and some mills have deformation patterns that vary with bar size. Information on rebar markings and mill marks for U.S. manufacturers of reinforcing bars can be found in the CRSI publication, Manual of Standard Practice, Chapter 1, and Appendix A. Mill test certificates should be readily available to the inspector. Okay, now here's our typical stop end that would be used to, uh, to orient the pre-stressing strands that we would use to apply that compressive force to the beam end. Now note, these strands are not tensioned, they are slack, so it, there's no danger here. You must be very, very careful with fully tensioned pre-stressing strands because there is a massive amount of force that can be contained in each of these strands. This particular strand, in fact, we would actually tension up to a load of 209 kilonewtons in just one strand. So what we would do, these strands would be jacked up. They would be pulled back and they would be essentially stretched. They would be put into that very large amount of tension, 209 kilonewtons for these. The concrete would be cast around the strands into the appropriate cross-section. Once that concrete has reached the specified strength, the com specified compressive strength, then the strands would be gradually released, thereby transferring that force that was in the strands when they were stretched into the concrete. So that very large force in the strands would be then applied as compression into the beam itself. Now, notice with this strand layout, there's a far larger number of strands closer to the bottom of the beam. The bottom of the beam, the soft of the beam would be just 50 mil underneath the actual uh, bottom of the strands, 50 or 60 mil. 
The reason for that is not only do we want to apply compression to the beam, we also want to apply a bending moment to the beam as a result of the pre-stressing operation. So because that overall position of the strands is eccentric, it's removed from the centroid of the beam, that enables that application of the pre-stress to also apply a bending moment that will counteract, will act against and relieve the bending moment that results from the applied loads, the loads that will be applied to the beam under working conditions. Let's step back over to the finished beam itself and go through the final steps of the final aspects of how a pre-stressed bridge beam works. Okay, so this beam is one of our finished products. This was actually cast not long ago on this bed itself. Now, you'll notice there's a bit of a gap between the soffit of the beam and the actual bed itself. This is a result of what we just spoke about. When we apply that compressive force from the pre-stressing tendons, pre-stressing strands, not only do they apply that beneficial compressive force to the beam, but they also apply a moment that relieves the moment applied under working conditions. So this moment that's applied by the pre-stressing operation results in the beams actually cambering up. The beam will actually lift up several millimeters, 10 millimeters, whatever the case may be, depending upon the beam and the pre-stressing amount and layout used. It will actually camber up. Now this is beneficial with regard to deflection checks as well too. Generally for bridge beam design we don't need to carry out rigorous deflection checks but from an aesthetic point of view you don't want a beam visually sagging on site. So this natural camber that results from the pre-stressing operation itself will help eliminate the potential that that beam would be visibly sagging on site as well too. Finally you'll notice as well too we've got shear links in the beam as well. Um, the shear links to be used in the bridge beam would really be not substantially different from what would be you may be accustomed to for reinforced concrete bridge beam design too. So again, so bridge beams, pre-stressed concrete bridge beams would also make provision for shear design, shear reinforcement as well. Okay, so in order to summarize how pre-stressed, pre-cast bridge beams work, beams are intended to carry flexure as well as shear, but that flexure that they're going to carry results in tension in one face of the beam. Concrete is not good in tension. In reinforced concrete, we use bars, steel bars, but in pre-stressed concrete design, we apply compression in order to overcome that tensile stress in the beam due to flexure. The force is applied using pre-stressing strands. The pre-stressing strands are stretched, Concrete is cast around the strands in pretension concrete, and the strands are slowly released, thereby applying that compressive force to the beam while simultaneously applying a moment to the beam that also acts to relieve the applied moment. I should also point out as well, too, that what I've been speaking about here relates to pretension, pre-cast, pre-stressed bridge beam design. There is also post-tensioning, post-tension bridge beams, which are slightly different, well, rather different from pre-tension bridge beam designs. The building you see behind me here is a 13-story residential high-rise in the Belltown neighborhood of Seattle. The uh, structure for this building is uh, concrete columns with a series of uh, floor slabs placed in between them. The great thing about concrete is its ability to withstand pressure under compression. So all the forces from the building are transferred into the columns and down into the foundation where the active soil pressure, uh, bearing pressure of the soil helps it stand up. The concrete slabs are actually a little bit different. They don't do very well in a level playing field. So what, hap what tends to happen with the concrete slabs is that it will sag over time. To counteract that uh, sag, there are cables that are placed into the concrete, which is known as a post-tension cable system. 
let's go into the building and take a look at the cable system as it's being placed inside. Each one of the cables comes to the site as a bundled package. In this case, they're uh, bundled in, in three cable sections. Each cable has a specific length that's been called out by the structural engineer. That is labeled on each cable so when they get up to the location in the slab, they can lay it down in precisely the right place. We're currently standing on the upper deck of this high rise and the forms have been placed for the bottom of the concrete slab. The steel reinforcing has also been placed as well as some of the electrical cable that's embedded into the slab. The lighter blue cable that we have over here is the concrete cable that we've been talking about, the post-tension cable system. It has a blue sleeve over it. It is placed stationary at one end and allowed to run loose all the way through the slab to the other end. We're currently looking at the stationary end of the cable. As you can see, the cable runs along and then it's in set into a grease pocketed portion of another cable here. That sleeve is tied into a stationary uh, end here, which is also then subsequently tied into the reinforcing system. Once the concrete is placed in here, this whole end is encapsulated and held solid. At the other end of the cable, you still have a greased pocketed end here, but your your end piece is slightly different. It has a conical shape and your cable is run long on this end. So once the concrete is placed, um, a construction worker will come back and attach a wedge to this piece inside, pull the cable with a pneumatic machine, and then cut the end off. 